It takes a year like 2024 to learn a lot about some of the different varieties. And 2024 was a year we learned a lot about the different varieties that are out there on the marketplace. In this next segment, I'm going to dive in a little deeper as to how the spring wheat did on the Petura Seed Family Farm in Domain, Manitoba, what we learned about it, why it was good for a wheat year, and what did we learn about the different varieties as to which is going to excel the most in what conditions, and then most importantly, tie it back into what variety is best suited for you on your farm and your management practices. So here's a snapshot of how we managed the, the wheat on our farm. Anywhere from 27 to 34 live plants a square foot. We had low rates of mortality due to lots of rainfall following seeding. And then in crop, uh, we had to use a fair bit of nitrogen to manage our nitrogen losses from excess moisture. We had a very, very cool June, which increased the amount of tillering and stem elongation in our wheat this year. And with cool and wet conditions, a lot of fungicide needed to protect against disease. And that's exactly what we had to do. So let's take a deeper dive into the conditions that caused such a good wheat year. <clears throat> Here is the heights of bran and wheat. Why is this important? This year we saw excessively tall wheat because it was cool and wet in May and June which is ideal wheat growing conditions. And that's also the ideal time for yield development early on. And so we saw high rates of tillering, anywhere from two, sorry, 1.7 to 2.9 tillers per plant in wheat. And you better believe it, we saw differences in how varieties tillered. Let's look at SYMS, a new hard red spring wheat on the market. It had the least amount of tillers of all of our wheat varieties. It, in, it averaged anywhere from 1.7 to 2 tillers per plant. Whereas our agriculture and agri-food Canada varieties on the farm, such as Hockley, Starbuck, and Brandon, all had anywhere from 2 to 2.9 tillers. And that's all assuming a relatively similar plant stand. So big in efforts in gen genetics and how it tillered in the environment. We also saw a huge difference in height uh, Hockley and Manus being the shortest hard red spring wheat varieties out there, Starbuck and Brandon being that much taller. Wheats like Faller and Prosper and Wheatland that have been on the market for quite some time also were taller than the Brandon and the Starbucks of the world, which is what we'd expect to see. However, in the past four years, we've had wheats range from 25 inches to 42 inches. Um, depending on the growing season. But what's important is the relative difference, seeing Hockley and Manus being shorter than the Starbucks, Brandon, Hodges, Wheatlands, Fallers. So those are all things you need to think about when picking a wheat variety for your farm based on what growing conditions you're anticipating. For next year, we've got lots of moisture in the soil profile. So we're gonna err on the side of caution and be selective with our wheat varieties based on the heights that we saw last year. And I could talk about genetics and height differences all, but at the end of the day, what's most important is what was the yield outcomes? So I'm gonna block the yield numbers just slightly with my noodle. And what I wanna highlight here is seeding dates. On our farm, what we learned was varieties played a big role, nitrogen played a big role in yield, <clears throat> but most importantly, seeding date played the biggest role. I wanna, you know, take you down a, um, a walk down what the spring was like. We had two to three days of seeding at a time, rainfall. Two to three days of seeding, then rainfall. And what we learned was the earlier seeding had the biggest impact on yield difference. And when you look at this and the actual yields by field now, you see what I mean. Our SY Manus, exceptional yield really showed its yield potential in ideal growing conditions. It was also the first seeded. It was the biggest wheat plant, had the most roots developed when we reached saturation in the back half of May and June, compared to the Hockley, Brandon, and Starbuck on our farm. Now, those yields are exceptional. They're strong. They're one of the best wheat years that we have had on the farm. 
And so again, it just speaks to those cool wet growing conditions in May and June and how great it is for a cereal crop to see that because you get uh, lots of tailoring and lots of yield development early in a, plant, a wheat plant's life cycle. Jumping back to the varieties, Hockley, Brand, and Starbuck. What did we see? Um, Hockley, consistently strong yield. And where did a lot of that come from? Consistency in standing. Man, did Hockley stand well. It didn't no matter where you were in Manitoba, it stood for growers. And that was the difference between two to five bushels if you had another wheat variety that did lodge. <clears throat> In our brand in Starbuck, we had lodging at times, but always came back up. So it wasn't our biggest yield de decrease, but <clears throat> we still saw the newer genetics of Hockley outperform the age-old favorites like Brandon and Starbuck. Before I move past this slide, I want to key in on two different things. And I mentioned it when we were talking about heights. And what I'm referring to is breeding programs. We really saw a difference in varieties and the breeding program and how they handled different stresses. S.Y. Manus, for example, it was originally bred to be a CPS wheat. However, it ended up with baking characteristics, protein characteristics, that allowed it to be registered as a hard red spring wheat. And this wheat variety is distributed by FP Genetics, but originally bred by Syngenta. That's what that S.Y. stands for. So if we take that and we compare it against our agriculture and agri-food Canada varieties that came out of a different breeding program, it's clear to see that they are different. With S.Y. Manus, we saw a lower rate of tillering. I've mentioned that already. We saw shorter straw, but we saw head size compensate when we had less tillers. The heads of S.Y. Manus were longer than our Hockley, Brandon, Starbuck, and Hodge fields. So that's where it made up its yield. We also saw a smaller kernel in Manus. We also saw lower protein, anywhere from 0.2 to 0.6 less protein in our Manus. But on the flip side, we made up for it in yield. The other thing we saw out of our Manus is it spent more time in the uh, growing and yield development phase there, there's the length of the S.Y. Manus head I was referring to. But I want to highlight this picture here. These wheats were seeded on the same day. Look at how delayed Manus was of that head coming out of the boot. We saw S.Y. Manus spend anywhere from one to three days more um, from seeding to fusarium head blight timing compared to agriculture and agri-food canna varieties. So more time in the yield development phase makes sense that it's more yield. The neat thing is, this field was harvested on the same day. It had a, Manus had a shorter window of protein development than Starbuck did, which also explains why Manus is going to see a slight decrease in protein over Starbuck. So again, what I'm trying to highlight here, the key takeaway is different breeding programs, different genetic background, different performance in the same environments. And that's what I love about this. We're entering a time in Manitoba and Western Canada where we've got diversity in genetics and we're gonna be able to pick and choose the wheat that's right for your farm based on the growing conditions, the management practices that you see fit. And one other picture, Hockley wheat, I mentioned, where did it perform well? Standability. We had 12 to 20 inches of rain depending on, on the Hockley field you're talking about across Manitoba, and Hockley stood the best out of all of them. That's, that's where it's going to stand. If you've got a high manure field, um, high nitrogen, changing your nitrogen plans last minute from a corn crop to a wheat crop, Hockley's going to be the variety for you. Again, just another example of picking the right genetics for the right field with the right anticipated conditions. I'm going to jump back a little bit and I want to highlight uh, one more thing. And that is why the significant yield drag. And I just want to drill this down. Seeding date was so crucial to our farm and our outcome of what we learned this year. Um, 
making such a big difference. It's really not a knock on the varieties. I wouldn't expect the Starbuck and the Brandons to be 10 to 20 bushels less. This was simply a function of seeding date. So important to keep that in mind going into next year. And uh, as we as we move forward and think about next year, you know, after an exceptional wheat year, um, it's nice to take a step back. Take a look at this field. This is now the highest yielding field that we've ever had on the Petura Seed Farm. And boy, is it exciting to know that we can break 100. What does it do? It makes us think about where can we go? What can we get to? What do we have to do different in order to push that yield limits to 110, 120? Genetics are going to be the key to success, but it's how you manage those genetics is going to get us to those new yield goals of 120 bushels an acre. Call it extreme, but I believe it's possible for you because I know it's possible for our farm. We just got to figure out how to do it. So that's a quick snapshot of a year in review at Petura Seed Farms for wheat, lessons we learned, key takeaways, and how we're positioning wheat with our customers for next year. This is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of content that we have for all of our crops. Find us on social media, give us a like, give us a follow. Uh, we're posting on a yearly basis around the calendar and uh, trying to bring new content that's relevant to you to help you better on your farm.